Hi, everyone. Yeah, so as Christina mentioned, uh, we're lucky enough uh, to be joined today uh, by Eddie Hartman, who I've worked with in the past. Uh, he's a partner at Simon Kusha. Uh, and before that, he's had a wealth of experience. He was also one of the co-founders of LegalZoom. Uh, so he's brought together kind of years and years of uh, experience in the operating side, but also he's a partner at Simon Kusha, a pricing expert uh, in SaaS. So without further ado, um, I'll let Eddie take it away. Um, it's a really good framework. I've, I've started working through it with him and uh, I'm really impressed by uh, what they've come up with. Thank you, James. Uh, first, I just want to ask, is my audio coming through clearly? It is, sounds great. Awesome, great, great. Hi, everybody. So yeah, as, uh, as James said, I was an operator uh, I ran a few businesses, one of the probably the best known of which is LegalZoom uh, with, with about 1,500 employee, uh, employees worldwide. So I've been a consultant. Uh, I've been an operator. What I really want to do is show respect for the time that you're giving me today by giving you something valuable that you can take away and use directly. Uh, that's, that's a primary concern to me. We've given a generous amount of time to Q&A. So, I'll go through the slides and then we'll have a, a very um, extended Q&A period. So I really do encourage you to think that through. Uh, I'm here to answer your questions. I really want to give you something you can, you can take away and use. So getting right into it, everyone knows that this is an extremely unusual scenario. We know that this is going to be a very different pattern from things that we've seen in the past. And Anyone who tells you that they can predict the course of this particular pandemic, uh, I, you know, I would stop listening to them immediately. The, the truth is nobody really does know whether we're facing something fairly linear or something resurgent, something that has one major episode or something that's multi-episodic. We just don't know. There's really no way to know. That said, we can reduce the set of unknown unknowns into a set of known unknowns, uh, specifically, we're aware that there will be a recovery, and we can look back on the data that we have from 2008, 2000, multiple other crises to say, what general shape will this take? For example, we know from prior crises that the collapse phase is rarely more than 90 days. And maybe most significantly, we know, as I said, that there will be a recovery. The important thing to understand is that everyone's experience of this is going to be a little different. Um, I have been on the phone recently with clients of mine who are experiencing wild demand. Uh, if you are Instacart, if you are Zoom, if you are a video game provider, you are experiencing a wild in, you know, increase in demand. Other people, of course, are experiencing an extreme decrease uh, or expect to end the year 20 to 30% down. Your situation will be different. The industry that you're in matters. The geography that you're in matters. And so this is not a, a sort of unified crash as some of the previous crashes have been. This is one where we really need to say, who are you and what are you seeing? Nevertheless, many, many people will react the same way. So this is the irony. Everyone's crisis is different, but many people are reacting with a simple across the board change to prices. Uh, and again, in most cases, this is a price cut. Uh, in some cases, they're, they're increasing prices to take advantage of surging demand. But in many cases, it, and, and oftentimes being you know, described as a price gouging, uh, but for many, many people, for the majority of us, uh, the, the temptation is to just cut prices in the hopes that volume will respond. But our historical data says that's really not likely. There are many, many factors behind softening demand. Price is one of them, but it's actually a minority reason. If you cut prices across the board, you're not likely to get the return that you're hoping for, but you will almost certainly harm your long-term price integrity. So what should we do? Uh, what we recommend is begin with a self-diagnosis, and that'll, that'll take two steps. In the first step of our self-diagnosis, we're going to say, which of the following characterizes my experience? Am I seeing a demand disruption? A demand disruption is where the demand is suddenly vanished. You're paying for advertising, the advertising isn't there. Your customers, uh, you expected them to be top tier customers and they're turning out to be you know, a 
economy shoppers. Everything about your brand loyalty that you thought was going to be durable is suddenly gone. Where are the customers? In a market shock, it's very different. A market shock is where your competitors are reacting in a panicky way, where the conditions of the market itself may be disrupted so you can't deliver your goods, uh, or other factors that create an imbalance between you and the other elements of your commercial strategy. Finally, in a risk imbalance, it's not that the customers have vanished so much or that the market has been disrupted, but that your existing customers or that your potential customers are showing enormous reluctance to take on risk. They don't want to sign. The sales cycle is greatly attenuated. A lot of things have been pushed off. Things that you thought would close aren't closing. And you may even see some people willing to take on more risk if it allows them to preserve cash. Oftentimes these are seen in combination, but it's important to say first, before I do anything else, which of these am I seeing? What characterizes my specific situation? The next thing to ask is where am I in the sort of collapse bottom recovery cycle? And I don't mean to suggest by this that we're experiencing a V-shaped recovery. I, I hope that we are, but of course no one does know. What I'm trying to tell you is that your situation, again, will be different than others. And the best guide is not going to be macroeconomic factors or what the stock market's doing. Instead, look to your customers. If they are acting irrationally, if they're saying things like, I'm going to save every single one of my employees and I don't care what, then you're probably in the collapse phase. The collapse phase, and again, we may be going back again, depending upon what happens with uh, you know, exposure to the pandemic. So watch customers, if they start to become irrational, uh, if, if they're, if they're uh, experiencing extreme friction with things like nice to have features, if they're acting in a way that doesn't seem to make sense, if procurement, for example, has completely shut down, uh, you're in that paralyzed collapse phase, uh, potentially once again, uh, if you think that we're out of it currently. In the bottom though, what's the characteristic survival mode? People have become accustomed to the fact that they're in a collapse or that they're in a crisis they understand that this is the new normal. You'll hear that term a lot. You probably already have. You're going to look for things like procurement coming back, but being very, very, very cutthroat, uh, far more so than it was in good times. The bargain hunting is at an extreme. There'll be uh, a real, real aversion to loss and risk. So that characterizes the bottom. And then in the recovery, how do we know that we're in the recovery? You'll start to see green shoots. People will be buying once again on factors like convenience. In terms of payment, we can see this by saying, are people canceling? Are people missing payments? We're probably in a collapse, probably somewhere you know, heading toward the bottom. Are people on the other hand, trying to defer payments? You may be in the bottom. Are people making payments to probably in the recovery? So these are all guides to where you are in your own specific version of the crisis. Now, our framework is fairly simple, uh, just seven steps, because we're going to focus on the collapse in the bottom. And let me sort of break it down for you. You need to recategorize your customers. I don't know what segmentation scheme you had before, but now you need to bring in things like solvency, importance to you, the new risk that you're facing. You need to do that because you'll need to know whether or not they're vulnerable or valuable before you decide what concessions to give them and how to treat them. Once you've done that, you need to think through a concession strategy. You may have customers already calling you saying, I need to defer payment. I want to cancel. They're looking for discounts. They're looking for freebies. You'll need to know how to counter that. As a rule of thumb, you want to find three non-economic concessions before you give one economic concession. Then when you've got more time, if those are the short-term actions, the middle to longer-term actions are price proofing your price architecture. So you're gonna make your price architecture price proof during the crisis. How do you do that? You need to look at your feature assortment uh, that might've been on a platform, that might've been uh, you know, in, in a tiered structure like a good, better, best bronze, silver, gold, you want to think about 
pushing your features around differently so that they make sense in a crisis. The next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna to need to think through your price structure itself in order to make sure that it reflects the risk that your customers are actually facing. You're gonna to wanna to think through the packaging that you have to provide a de-featured offer, sometimes called a heartbeat offer or an LEA package. And then finally, and this is incredibly important, and I think doesn't get enough attention, even if you are in a terrible crisis, even if you're thinking you're gonna end the year 20 to 30% down, even if you're feeling somewhat beat up right now, remember, your competitors are in a crisis as well. This is a great moment to take share from incumbents and from your competitors. In fact, if you follow the steps one through six, you're in a great position to, in step seven, take market share away from people who've held it traditionally. So that, I'm gonna pause for a second and then we'll get into the slides. Should we, um, I, I think I saw one question coming up on the Q&A. Alex Chumbly asks, are we already seeing any trends in how companies respond by, chasing, by changing price architecture, which price metric is used, how price scales with volume usage, et cetera? Yeah, Alex, so I'm going to talk about this uh, in great detail. Uh, one of the very interesting things that we do see is people going toward a usage-based metric instead of a, for example, license metric uh, and coming up with better rewards in terms of volume discounting. Uh, they're, they're using increasingly not a traditional volume-based discount, but something called a regressive discount. What's the difference between a volume discount and a regressive discount? A regressive discount says, if you buy more than a thousand widgets, every additional widget is at a discount, as opposed to saying, if you buy a thousand and one widgets, the entire lot is at a discount. That seems like a subtle difference, but it plays especially well in a crisis. It can save you money, it can protect your profits, but it can also attract customers at nearly the same rate as a volume-based discount. Uh, and I'm asking, can I give examples of non-economic concessions in exchange for one economic concession? Yes, yes, yes. Co-marketing, longer-term commitments. These are all, um, yeah, actually, I think when you think of longer-term commitment and co-marketing, you're thinking about concessions on the customers. Uh, side. And we will talk about those. Those are very important. Uh, but I'm talking about concessions that you can give in the alternative to a non-economic uh, or an economic concession. And we'll go through how to think of those, how to identify those, and how to structure those. Great questions. Um, I think I'm going to move on to the next section. So the first thing to understand is that even long-standing clients of yours may not weather this storm. Uh, not everyone can be saved. Some people are going to be insolvent at the end of this and are just not worth investing in. Other customers of yours may not need to be saved. They may be doing just fine. So again, going back to the idea of offering an across-the-board uh, price break, you'd be benefiting some customers that don't need it. Uh, these are the ones that are Someone said to me recently, sitting in the corner quietly while everyone else is panicking. Not everyone needs to be saved and not everyone can be saved. So how do we think about this? This is a very simple analysis to categorize your customers. Put them into different clusters based according to what we call an ABCD analysis. You're going to stack them from the most valuable customers, the biggest accounts, to the smallest ones. And if you are in more of a you know, gold, silver, bronze structure, some of your gold customers will still be more valuable than your, than your silver or than your bronze. And some of your gold will be value, more valuable than other gold. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to find the 80-20, the people who are responsible for a lot of your revenue, so that you can figure out where to focus. We sometimes call this the vulnerable and the valuable. And it doesn't mean that some of your valuable accounts aren't vulnerable as well. It means that you need to start thinking of them in these terms in order to decide where are you going to target your very valuable concessions. A great tool for this is to do risk scoring. Uh, risk scoring can be done by taking the factors that you think drive churn 
and correlating them with churn if you haven't done this already. Also remember that churn is a lagging indicator, meaning that by the time that people churn, the dissatisfaction or the crisis has already probably set in. So you're going to look for other things that act as a bellwether for churn. You're going to then combine them. So when you found these are the factors that show me that a, an account is likely to churn or likely to shed dollars, you're then going to combine it with your uh, previous analysis to say, okay, of my high valued customers, which are at risk now, but don't ignore over in the green, the high valued customers who are not at risk. So we're looking specifically at this bar here. These are high valued customers and they're not at all at risk. What can we do with these? So these are the vulnerable, these are the valuable. The valuable customers can be pushed potentially for cross sells and upsells. We have something called a sold with analysis. A sold with analysis is simply to say a customer that buys product A is likely to also buy product B. Historically, customers that have bought product whatever also buy product additional. You can then go to this column of valuable customers that are not really that much at risk and see if they won't be willing to buy this additional thing. In, in other words, pursuing a bit more farming and a bit less hunting and paying more attention to these valuable customers. This also improves your CLTV to CAC ratio because you can now feed the data back into your acquisition strategy to say, how do I get more customers like this and how do I make them uh, produce a higher ARR. Let's get into the, uh, oh my goodness, sorry. We seem to have a sticky on this slide. Uh, just, a, just a moment, don't know how that happened. Sorry about this. You know, we like to say that um, AI is difficult but AZ is impossible. It is just sometimes not possible to make slides work. Sorry about that. Okay, we are back now. So we had a lot of questions about, well, what do I mean by uh, non-economic concessions and how can I identify them? So I'd say there's two or three things to focus on two or three places to dig for your non-economic concessions. The first thing is to say, do I have something of value that's being underutilized? For example, do I have members of my team that don't have anything to do uh, that could be packaged up as a, for example, as a concierge package and bonus to my best customers? Do I have inventory? If, imagine that you're in the, uh, that you sell uh, advertising uh, space. Well, do you have unsold inventory that can be uh, packaged up again and bonused and, you know, therefore in part little marginal cost to you? Can you do things like offering free cancellation? Can you offer uh, better payment terms? Uh, can you offer an increased service level? Can you offer a, a discount if the customer themselves is efficient? What can you do aside from giving away money? in order to make sure that your customer stays with you. Can you find things other than a discount uh, to give to them? I want to give you the example of Hyundai to start with. Hyundai entered the 2008 crash with 2% market share and a terrible brand reputation. I don't know if anyone remembers Hyundai from, from those years, but you know, honestly, they, they were, uh, they were you know, looked on as a joke. What did Hyundai do? I'm sure Hyundai was tempted to slash prices and they didn't do that. Hyundai also didn't introduce a new car or new features or anything like that. Hyundai just said, if you lose your job, you can bring back your car. Think about how simple and powerful that is. If you lose your job, if you find yourself in economic distress, you can bring back your vehicle because that's what everybody was worried about. Everyone was worried about being unable to, you know, make their lease payments or afford the car that they had their eye on. And Hyundai made it easy for them to say yes. 
again, not an economic concession, just a change in terms that made everything fit. Salesforce uh, right now is enhancing their standard package by adding more valuable, um, adding more value to more remote selling uh, tools that are specific to COVID. Uh, when people cancel or want to cancel or want to reduce, they are proactively going out and saying, we will give you more value. If you find these asymmetries, if you find either things that you have that are of value that you can offer your clients, or if you find points of risk things that they're concerned about that you can speak to directly, you're going to have a much easier time negotiating than someone who only has a discount uh, in their arsenal. If, that's the only, if, if a discount is the only tool that you have, you're potentially uh, in trouble. The next thing to do is when you have your concessions, you need to prioritize them according to the ones that will actually benefit you. So, for example, this would be a great time to give your best customers a taste of an upgraded package or of an add-on module. You'll want to think about which one is better for you, but the reason for it is that if you do that, uh, they may then pay full freight for it when the good times return. If a customer calls and says, hey, I want, a, you know, I want a free month or I want to cancel or I want uh, you know, some other economic concession from you, Think about creating something like loyalty credit. Loyalty credit's amazing because it gives you a reason, a fairness-based reason to offer a discount so that if other people call and they ask for exactly the same discount, oh, you know, I heard this guy got a discount, I want the same one, you can say, well, they've been with us for three years. You haven't. So it creates this fairness argument which is really effective in times of crisis, but it does something else. If that customer calls in again and wants to cancel, particularly in the bottom, you can say, if you cancel now, you will have to walk away from your loyalty credit. Now, that's a very powerful statement because again, in the bottom, people wanna hang on to every shred of advantage that they have. The psychology is you know, highly loss averse and it's a great way to retain people to point out, well, you know, you've been loyal for a long time, you've built up this credit, you don't wanna lose it. So again, when you have your concessions down, Think about the ones that are going to reward you uh, as well as your customer and label them. This may be the, the easiest hint that I give you in today's discussion. Label your concessions. Why? If you give a customer a discount, the customer assumes that that discount is perpetual, that it's never going to go away. If you later want to turn off that discount, good luck. How are you going to do it? How are you going to call the customer and say that discount is over? If on the other hand, you labeled it, if you had the foresight to say, this is a COVID-19 discount. This is an economic hardship rebate. This is, yes, it's an economic concession, but it's tied to the pandemic. It's tied to this particular crisis. Then you've got a way to turn that concession off and thereby preserve your price integrity. Now, I think that alone would be great but there's something even better. Once things start turning up again, once we start heading back into the recovery, once again, uh, well, in other words, once it becomes time to begin shutting off these concessions, you've created a natural appointment to talk to the customer. You can say, hey, I'm glad that we're able to help you through the crisis. The crisis is abating, it's lifting. We're gonna be uh, discontinuing that rebate. Is there anything else that we can help you with? In the 2008 crisis, this created an unexpected spike in demand. Because sure enough, if fortunes are turning upward, there's a lot that you can do to help your customers. And they will, they will reward you for having helped them through the bad times, usually uh, with additional business in the good times. So just label your concessions if you're gonna offer them. Make sure that, uh, and I think many of you probably have already figured this out, but I just wanna show you, this is a pretty typical discount cloud over on the left. Note that it's completely uncorrelated with customer size. You're not seeing that the concession, that the discount went up with the size of the customer as, you, as you'd hope. All, all too often, we do not do this. We do not put in uh, uh, discounts. We do not put in concessions that correlate uh, with what we get in return, with the size of our customer, with the promised uh, business. We give uh, a free month rather than asking for, for example, 
33% over three months and thereby ensuring that at least we get three more months of business, try to uh, steer the customer behavior through the concessions that you offer. Uh, also, this allows you to say something like, if, if they hear that somebody got a better concession, you can say, well, they brought me more business or they, they were willing to stay for a longer period. Or as I think somebody pointed out on the chat, they were willing to co-market. So ask for something in return. Say, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to give you that discount that you heard that Joe got. But here's what Joe did for me. Joe agreed to co-market. Joe agreed to a longer period. Joe said that he'd bring me more business and, you know, and in a way that had teeth. Get the concessions in exchange for the concessions that you give. And when you do, put them into what we call a concessions matrix. And this is a very, very important thing. This uses psychology on two sides, which I'll explain. A concessions matrix has four quadrants. You're gonna organize your concessions according to the cost to you and the importance to your customer. You'll begin in the lower left. You'll proceed to the upper left. And then if you need to, you'll go over to the right half, first to the upper right and then to the lower right. So it's a clockwise motion around the circle beginning in the southwest. Now, what do you do at each quadrant? In the southwest, you're going to offer goodwill concessions. These are things that are not very important to you and not of huge importance to the customer, but it creates goodwill. It says, well, yes, I can give you a break. I can give you this concession. The next quadrant that you move to, if the customer is still saying, well, that's not enough, I'm going to cancel, or that's not enough, I need more, you're going to go to the Northwest. Here you're giving the customer something that is valuable to them, but might not be as valuable to you. Think about that uh, concierge pack. That's something that might be very important to the customer, but very low cost to you, because after all, your customer service uh, team was sitting around with a lot of free time. Now, if you have to, move to the battleground, move to that Northeast quadrant. In the Northeast quadrant, you are going to be fighting for every inch because here's where things actually really do carry a cost to you as well as being important to the customer. This is where you're going to include things like uh, a, a lock on the price. So no price escalator for a year uh, or two years. Uh, true free months, true discounts. The third quadrant is where the, you'll, you'll give these things and you really want to fight for these. Now, what happens in the Southeast? The Southeast is where you give the lower level concessions. Now, that may be totally counterintuitive, right? If in, the, if in the Northeast, we were giving big discounts, we were giving free months, we were giving price locks, why in the, in the Southeast, in that, in that final quadrant, would we be going to a smaller discount? It's because you're trying to organically signal that the conversation is over. And that's the first psychology, that's the first psychological track we're using, customer psychology. You began with an opening gambit that said, listen, I'm willing to be reasonable. You moved to the Northwest that said, I will give you something that other people aren't getting, something scarce, something important, like a concierge pack. Then if you must, you are moving to the battleground and you're fighting for every inch over things like discounts. And then you are signaling that you are willing to go no further. If you just gave a 15% discount, you must now give something much smaller. If you just said you're getting $5,000 off the vehicle, in the, in, the, in the Southeast, you need to say, I, I can't do much more, but I can give you a tire rotation. I can give you a beer cozy. I can give you something smaller. It needs to organically signal that the, that the conversation is over and you're at the point of walk away. Otherwise, your counterparty will continue to push. Now, I said that there's two psychological tracks involved. One is the consumer psychology. What's the other one? That's your sales psychology. Somebody said to me the, uh, last week, uh, if you give a salesperson a bazooka, they will pull that out before they pull out a pistol. Forcing your sales team to go through this slow progression ensures that they will use the right tool for the job and that they will only give away the truly valuable things if they're forced to. This is, we found over time, the smartest way to make sure that you preserve the most valuable uh, value for yourself while retaining your best customers. And when you think about it, 
make sure that you think about this by segment because there's some concessions that you only want available for your best customers. Uh, and there's some concessions that potentially don't even make sense for one group or another. So think about the concessions, think about, uh, think about it for each uh, segment, think about it for uh, uh, retaining customers. Also think about how this might be used to acquire new customers and make sure that you've got a good talk track that goes with each uh, concessions matrix. It's fine to think of this stuff in theory. It may be very, very different on the ground. Be sure that you've gamed it out. Okay, so that was concessions, and I think that's, that's the first big idea. You need to defend yourself. You need to defend your prices. You need to not give discounts uh, except where you absolutely must. You need to fight tooth and nail over prices, uh, but make sure that you're retaining with a, with a carefully thought through strategy. But now let's talk about if you've got more time, what should you do with your overall price architecture? So we talked about Hyundai having a bad brand uh, going into 2008. How about this car? Who would drive this car? And the answer is people in, at the bottom of a crisis. That is who would drive this car. Now this car is meant to be a metaphor. This was a huge winner in the 2008 crisis, the Tata Nano. In good times, I don't think anyone would have introduced this car. But in bad times, it was a perfect fit and a huge winner at the time. Think about this in terms of what you offer. Again, what is the bottom characterized by? It's characterized by survival mode. In survival mode, your counterparty is going to want to have control. What does that mean? That means unbundling in certain cases. That means it, still offering what you offer, but offering it in a way where the customer can pick and choose a little bit more. If you'd been in a N-tiered structure, you may want to think about breaking more things out into supplements. The more a la carte you can get, the more stripped down you can get, the less friction you'll have. We like to say that in good times, saying something like, would you like fries with that is absolutely fine. But in crisis, it can be a killer. The best kind of strip down is what we sometimes call a heartbeat package or a defeatured package. This is a package that you do not offer when you're not in crisis. It's just there to allow customers to gracefully downgrade. Remember, they do not want to cancel. They probably like you very much. They like what you offer, but they're in a cash pinch. So what can you offer them instead of cancellation or instead of a, a discount? Offer them a trade-off. Say, of course, I can take your monthly bill down. I can take your annual bill down. I do have a package, but it's very defeatured. Now, this is subtly different than unbundling. It may involve unbundling, sure, you may strip things out, but you may also just diminish what they're able to do with the package. You know, the number of hours that they get, the number of sends that they get, whatever your metric is, you may pair it back for this heartbeat package. The whole idea here is that your customer, again, doesn't want to cancel, and it's much, much easier to reawaken a customer than it is to reacquire a customer. So giving them this heartbeat package, this LEA, this less expensive alternative, is a very, very smart idea. And like I said earlier, remember label concessions? At some point, you may want to shut off this package and force people back into the normal package structure. So think about calling it something like a, a, you know, a COVID package or a economic distress package, something like that, so that people understand that it may not always be there. Another great thing to do is to align the price metric, that's how people measure what they pay, with economic distress. This is very akin to what Hyundai did, where they said, look, you know, if you lose your job, if you have an economic hardship, then you won't have to pay. Let's start with Michelin. So Michelin came up, excuse me, with a truck tire that was fantastic, much more durable than the truck tires on the market. And again, a metaphor, I know that if you're in the Insight portfolio, you're not thinking about selling truck tires, but listen to what they did. They understood that trucks in France, because France is, you know, there, there's a lot of strikes in France, frequently don't move. Uh, and what they did was they said, instead of selling a truck tire, they're going to lease the tires based on the kilometers driven. 
Now this reinforced the quality of the tire because the tires were ultra durable and it allowed the truckers to pass the bill onto their end customer, which was super good. But it also reflected this idea that if the truck isn't moving, if the person who owns the truck isn't making any money, then they don't have to pay anything to Michelin. This is a breakthrough. It took Michelin from the number three tire company to the number one tire company. Uh, and this kind of thinking, this usage thinking has been adopted by many different industries. We were recently talking to a back-end software for a chain of hair salons. Uh, I should say, they're not for a chain, sorry. They're the back-end software that's used by chains of hair salons, many different ones. And as you can imagine, hair salons right now are just in terrible distress, about as distressed as anyone I can think of. But what they did, or what we're encouraging them to do, is to move from a license model to a usage model for their best customers. So now their customers can say, if my doors aren't open, if money isn't coming in to me, then I don't have to pay anything to this back-end software company. Um, as you'll see on the next slide, they're also using this to go after competitors. And I think it's uh, going to be enormously successful for them. Also think about, particularly in a crisis, aligning with fairness. What really, to your customer, generates that feeling that, yeah, you know, that, that I'm getting what I pay for. That's super important right now. And over on the left, aligning with risk. So we had a client in the oil and gas industry, a software client. And at the time, oil and gas was going through the floor. So at the trough of the last crisis, they were laying off people left and right. But our client made money based on the number of licenses. Well, if people are being laid off. The license count is going down, and so is ARR. So what we did is we said, okay, look, let's reset. We'll reset according to the price of a barrel of oil. Think about that. We said to people in the oil and gas industry, you will pay for this software, a monthly fee, weighted based on the price of a barrel of West Texas intermediate crude. Everybody loved it, but what did it do? It set the level point at the lowest moment, at the moment of the trough of the crisis. After that, things went up, and that software company was able to make a lot more money than they had based on a license model. Finally, uh, as I was saying earlier, a crisis is a great time to say, can I find weakness among my competitors? Remember again, you're not the only one in a crisis. Your competitors are in a crisis as well. So how do we approach this? The first thing to do is to analyze your competitors to find where their feature sets are failing, particularly if they've adjusted them during the crisis. Look at any promotions that they're offering. Understand where you might find vulnerability on the part of your customer or the part of your competitors. Next, think about the fact that they are probably neglecting some portions of their base because they did not do the, the activity that you did in step one, where you triaged. Many of your competitors will fail to do that and they'll be neglecting some parts of their, their valuable customer base. Then think, which of the things that I may have established previously would create a great promotion to take share away from my competitors? Could this be structured, for example, as a trade-in program? Think about that back-end platform for hair salons. Could they go after the hair salons that are backed by their competitor's platform and say, show me that you canceled with my competitor? Show me the email, show me the cancellation. And just like a car trade-in, I will put you on a usage-only package where for the rest of the year, you pay no fees unless you're making money. Think about how effective that could be in terms of grabbing share away during this crisis. So I'm going to pause there for questions. Again, we talked about triaging in order to decide who to give concessions to. We talked about how to identify concessions to give and making sure that we got something in return. We talked about using a concessions matrix in order to say, let's use consumer psychology as well as sales psychology to deliver concessions in a really targeted way. We said, let's price proof and crisis proof our price architecture by reassorting features and coming up with a stripped down model. 
coming up with a, uh, a heartbeat package, uh, you know, a lower feature package that people could gracefully downgrade into. And finally, we talked about changing the way that people pay, because in a crisis, how you pay is more important than what you pay in, in a huge way. Uh, and finally, thinking about how we could use this to say, how could we take share away from incumbents? So with that, I'm going to turn it over to ask some questions, uh, or sorry, to answer some questions from people in the uh, audience. Okay. So I think we answered the question, uh, can we give examples of non-economic concessions? Uh, right, okay, we already talked about that. Uh, so the introduction of an LEA will absolutely have a future impact on prices. And Bar Bartolome Salas asks, if you introduce an LEA, won't that have an, an, uh, an impact on prices? It does, it will. So what you have to ask yourself is, because that will almost certainly cannibalize uh, it's the thing that you, it's the sort of thing, first of all, you would never put it on your website. So if your website uh, shows your packages, you would want to make sure that it does not appear on your website. The next thing you want to do is for the customers that are offered this heartbeat package, you want to make sure that it's labeled. So that at the end of the crisis, you can discontinue the package and then ask people, hey, we're discontinuing this package. Would you like to go back to your original package? Uh, you know, maybe even offer them a, a ramp so that they can you know, gradually get up to that, that price again. Uh, again, it's great to create an appointment to go talk to your customers when good times return. And, and if I might just uh, jump in there as well, I think what sure. the uh, really important thing when designing that LEA is thinking about how you can really cut that value out to, to pr produce effectively that minimum viable package. So you want something that in good times, most of your customers wouldn't actually choose. That makes the migration at the end of it a lot easier because certainly within SaaS, it's going, a lot of companies won't want to do forced migrations. So you want to kind of upsell them over time. And at the same principle as any other landing span model, you'll be looking at, okay, what are those features? How do we make sure that that package is um, effectively as uh, kind of minimum and, and stripped down as possible so that the package above it uh, looks much, much more attractive. So that when the economy starts to rebound, when the businesses of your customers start to rebound, they will have almost kind of, they, they will have a no brainer decision to upsell because they'll get more value for money uh, with that package that's above it as well. Thanks James. Yeah, that, that's a super important point. Um, most people just don't have the stomach to do this. And I often get the question, won't that hurt our brand? Won't it hurt perception? The answer is usually no. Uh, it does not hurt the brand and it does not hurt perception because the only customers that would be offered the LEA, that's the heartbeat package, would be people who've already experienced the brand and had a good time with it. It's so hard to do, uh, but think about things like really, really, really taking down the utility. Again, imagine that you're in the business of sending emails. Still allow the client, your customer, to send emails with your LEA package but a very limited set, only a few dozen. Some, you know, that may be too severe, but choke it, choke it down to the point that no one in their right mind would choose this during good times. But remember too, in bad times, it may be a perfect fit if their usage is down. So if you can tie it to the low usage that they have during a crisis, they will naturally be asking to go back to their old package when the crisis has been averted. So let's see. Shaina Zhang is asking, this is helpful. Thank you, Shaina. What are your thoughts approaching new customers with user-based versus usage-based versus solution bundle pricing? Uh, I.e. you get XX users with XX usage in this solution. If you need more, you buy an expansion pack. Yeah, so Shaina, that sort of idea of creating a, um, you know, a secondary price metric, you're paying this amount, but it's a bit stripped down and there's an overage fee, works really, 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 really well in the bottom. Uh, it's the perfect kind of example of, 
of this. So consider if you're offering, for example, a, an unlimited package and people feel it's too expensive, consider creating a package that has a certain amount of utility to it, but people need to buy an, buy an expansion pack or they need to supplement with, uh, with something else in order to get uh, the, you know, the value that they look for. People at the bottom will love this. And the reason that they'll love it is it allows them to gain control. They can just buy what they think they need. And if, then, if, if they run into more usage, if they run into more needs, then they can buy supplements as they will. This is also very good for you because potentially you can create a structure so that the total price that you gain is more than they would have paid you up front. In other words, if you can, if you can transform it uh, into a pay-as-you-go model, you may wind up making more money than you would have uh, up front, particularly in a crisis. So I think we're, we're just waiting for any additional questions. I, I have one actually. Uh, so when you mentioned on the concession matrix that it's good to kind of force sales in to following that, uh, what are the kind of mechanisms or what are the best ways that you see to do that? Right, so it'll depend upon how structured your sales team is. Um, I've seen it done recently where people have decided that each square of the matrix represents a different group of salespeople. So some salespeople are only able to do the first square. Others are allowed to do the second square, but this is an escalation path. So if this is a, you know, account rep, uh, this is more of an account director or sorry, account manager. Uh, and then the third would be like a vice president. So only the vice president would even be given the bazooka of a price lock or something like that. I've seen that done. Some people though feel that that's too cumbersome, too many, uh, you know, you need to change hands. Uh, and so what they do instead is they change it to a compensation based model. Hang on a second, I do have a slide on this. So they'll actually say, you know, I am going to unhide these two slides and show this slide. So it's important to recognize that in a crisis, first, not everybody's going to be able to do this. You may not have the sorts of people that are good at being restrained. Uh, remember that your sales team, the average tenure is about six years they've never sold into this kind of an environment. Uh, they may not have the sort of internal, um, you know, the acumen uh, where they can restrain themselves. Uh, but a, a really great tool is to compensate, okay, based on the metrics that tie back to that concessions matrix. If they can achieve net retention in a crisis while giving away fewer concessions, that is the sort of thing you want to compensate. And by the way, as we move out of the bottom into a recovery, you want to incentivize new business, finding new shoots, green shoots. So this moment, uh, this sort of crisis moment, is a particularly interesting one in that you can relook, re you can relook comp out of cycle without losing good people. If you tried to do that during good times, you would lose good people by relooking comp mid-year. But you can do it right now. And a smart way to do it is to tie comp to how they use that concessions matrix. Tie it to net retention, but only as a function of the concessions that they grant. That makes sense. Um, and if anyone else has any questions, please, uh, please type them in on the Q&A. Um, I do actually have one other question, uh, which is at what point do you know when to offer kind of what are the signals of when to start offering an LEA and what are the 
signals and, and the real kind of decision factors that lead you to discontinue it? Right, so an LEA is, if you want to think of it this way, it's a more sophisticated concession. It says, it says to a customer who you know, you, you know is likely to cancel, it says, I want to retain you, and I want to retain you so badly that I've created a package just for you. It gives you a discount, but at the trade-off of a feature attenuation. So when would you create it? You'd create it when you started to see people really pushing back uh, and demanding some sort of an economic break. You'd want to create it if you also really thought that some of these, some of these uh, companies were in danger of not surviving the crisis unless you gave them some sort of a concession. Uh, you also want to especially offer this uh, if you feel like your price integrity would be harmed by giving away too much in terms of uh, economic value. Okay, and I think uh, so, question. Yeah, so an, thanks, James. Yeah, so an anonymous attendee asks, how do customers react to overage pricing? if the volumes come back before the recovery of the particular industry. Is this a result of bottom ticking volume allotments to provide a logical reason to reduce the price? Interesting. Um, uh, you know, if you, can, if you can, a lot of this rests on presentation. So customers understand when they sign up for a model, what the ramifications are. If they sign on to a model that has overage fees, but presents a much lower upfront price, what they're betting on is that the volume will not materialize, that the usage will not materialize, that they will not have a need such that they encourage, they encounter those overage fees. In my experience, when people have actually hit those overage fees because the volume suddenly materialized, they were not unhappy. They were not unhappy for two reasons. The first was that they understood clearly the bargain that they were making up front, which was one to preserve, you know, upfront cash. Uh, the other is, the very reason motivating the overage was that they had a lot of volume. So no customers don't, uh, don't react to it as you know, like unfair or unjust or extremely negatively. I will say that uh, this is potentially a moment to waive the overage fee if they'll go into a higher tier package. So potentially you can play it both ways. Um, I, I might add to that very quickly that it also depends on the strength of your, your value metric, but if your value metric is strong enough that it's really tied to the customer's value or, or what drives their business, then the arguments won't, won't be, uh, it's, it's unlikely that you'll see that many arguments uh, because they will only be paying as their business is recovering. And, and an example here is that uh, a company that I know uh, is a, a vendor for house party, which is the, the app that uh, you can kind of join um, and they have just received an overage that is more than double their current contract value and they're not complaining at all because realistically that they know that even despite there being a cash crunch for their business to a certain extent they are also in a good place uh, economically and they're set up for a good place economically because their their um, their usage is going up going through the roof so uh, Typically, if, if your value metric is strong enough, hopefully those, those conversations won't even happen that much. Yep. Great point. Thanks, James. Um, uh, Bartolome asks additionally, uh, what about SLA? Uh, and yes, SLA concessions are a fantastic example of a non-economic dimension. So you can either increase the SLA uh, which can be, often be very valuable, you know, time to service, amount of service, um, you know, uptime guarantees as part of the concession, or when you go to an LEA, uh, reducing the SLA. Now, a lot of people will say, well, wait a second, um, should I do that though? Because the customer would now be maybe more likely to really churn if they're not getting the handholding. I think, unfortunately, that's one of the trade-offs of an SLA, of an LEA, of a heartbeat package, you really do need to limit the amount of service because service tends to be expensive. There's a real cost to it. Uh, and with an LEA package, you're trying to just maintain people. And in fact, it's often that very specific fact that they're cut off from support 
that forces a person to get out of the LEA and back into a full freight package. I know that we're almost out of time. I'm hoping to take one more question. Um, let's see. Have I seen any customers tailoring their concessions by regions? Oh my goodness, yes, absolutely. So the dimensions that people tailor concessions around are almost always um, acquisition concessions and retention concessions. And then they're almost always grouped by segment. But yes, absolutely, so by region or by industry, that often happens as well. Let's face it, there's some concessions that just don't make sense uh, in US that make a ton of sense in Asia Pac. Um, also global, so there may be some concessions that really make sense for global businesses that don't make sense for uh, uh, domestic businesses. So yes, absolutely, uh, customers definitely do tailor their concessions according to regions uh, all the time. Listen, I know that we're out of time. Uh, this has been a very robust conversation. Uh, James knows that one of the things that we offer to people in the Insight portfolio, but you know, only in the Insight portfolio, uh, is if, you, if you'd like me to spend more time with you on these questions, uh, or if you want me to spend time with you on, for example, thinking through concessions, I'm absolutely willing to do so. Um, it'd be happy limited, like, like two hours. Uh, but if if you'd like me to get together with your sort of leadership team and talk this stuff through, through I'm I'm absolutely happy to. One of our partners says uh, crises are where relationships are built, and so this is just a sort of goodwill thing for people in the Insight portfolio. Other than that, um, I think the slides are available on request. James, is that right? And James, I think you're on mute. Yep. Yeah, the slides will be available on request and we'll be uploading the webinar recording um, after this point. Excellent. Again, I, I want to let you know before before we close out, again, I am an entrepreneur or I, I you know, have been